and also with you. Let us pray. Okay. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gift of the Holy Scriptures. We pray that by your Holy Spirit they would be transformed from signs on a page to channels of grace into our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So, as I said uh, last week, we, we closed out Luke and we're on to John. And so, uh, the, the unheard words in the Gospel of John are going to be coming to us really in big blocks. Because the Synoptic Gospels, which are the main, basically these are the Gospels that are read. Your A, B, C is basically Matthew, Mark, Luke um, in our lectionary year. And then with basically highlights from John put into the lectionary, the Sunday lectionary, especially around uh, Lent and Easter. The Lenten and Easter tide readings are a favor John. And so we tend to bring John in for that. Of course, the famous prologue to John's gospel, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, there wasn't anything created without the Word. So we read that at Christmas time, right? So that's a famous Christmas reading. And then the one exception is that it, we call it the, the month of bread, um, which is uh, in year B, uh, and it's frightening now. I've been, doing, I've been at this business long enough that now I, like, I know this now. So sometime around July, August, in year B, uh, there are, we go through John chapter 6 in four Sundays in a row. We just kind of work our way through the bread of life sayings. You know, it's like, it's like more bread of life. Like, I've already done the bread of life sermon. Like, and yet there's more bread of life. And it's like, you know, how many sermons can I write? Um, so that's why uh, people like me take vacations and assign their curates to preach <laughs> in the month of July. It's like, here, have fun with John chapter 6. Um, and, uh, so, and it, but you'd really have to take all your vacation to escape John chapter 6. So, um, but anyway, so what we get then is what, as we move through John's gospel, we'll, real, we'll really be encountering long sections of the gospel, as opposed to in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, we would have, sometimes we'd have in this class, uh, like small, you know, two or three verses at a time that weren't covered. So, th so I'm excited about kind of tackling some larger blocks of material. So first, um, um, speaking of a, of, a, of a gospel with a prologue, I'll start with some prolegumenon about uh, kind of a, some words before the words um, about John's gospel as a whole and how it's different from the synoptic gospels, which are, you know, Mark, Matthew, Luke, um, those three gospels, which as I've talked about before and as I've been teaching, you basically you have Mark coming in as the first one, right, the, as the first gospel committed to writing. And um, again, we have to recognize that Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, they didn't know they were writing gospels as a literary genre. <laughs> you know, they, they, they invented, you know, we call that late, we name it later. Mark starts out by saying the good news of Jesus Christ, which the word is evangelion or gospel. Uh -huh. So he was just, he's, he was making, you know, Mark, Basically, you have to imagine what Mark imagined he was doing is unrolling the scroll because an Evangelion was that royal proclamation, right? And so it's kind of like, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, right? That's, that's what he thought he was doing. He wasn't engaged in a literary project. Um, like, you know, people who, you know, English majors who want to write the great American novel. That's not what he was, that's not what they were trying to do. So... But, so you have Mark has his narrative structure. So Mark's achievement, and I really talk about in terms of an achievement, that Mark's achievement is to develop a narrative structure which is so compelling and so organized and so coherent with the cross and the resurrection, which is what, again, as I've talked about, that's what he starts with, is the, the passion. Basically, the passion is committed to a, to a, a fairly standard telling very early on, right? Um, which is why there are proof texts in it, right? Because it's, they, they've been telling that story the same way for a long time, you know, like say 20 years or so before Mark writes. And, and his narrative is so um, compelling and 
supportive of understanding the, the, the meaning of Jesus' achievement on the cross, that it becomes normative. And such that Mark and, or Matthew and Luke separately take Mark's narrative structure and use it as the backbone of theirs. I mean, that's an achievement. So you have basically two, and, and especially given that, you know, Matthew is writing for this, has, has, you know, there's kind of some review as well, an opportunity to review. So Matthew is writing for the Semitic church that he was dealing with, probably somewhere in Syria, in what we, you know, in the modern day Syria, but close to Galilee, we think, or maybe even in Judea, we don't know, somewhere in there, but a Semitic uh, Jewish church. And so he used it for that context, and Luke, writing for Gentile churches in the Mediterranean littoral, is, uh, uses the same narrative structure. That's how powerful, that's how great Mark's achievement is. That you, for both those different contexts, it becomes the normative structure of telling the story of Jesus. So, and then, as I, I've talked before, Matthew and Luke take Jesus' sayings and drop them into that narrative in their own ways. Okay, so we've covered all that as we went along. John is a different animal. It, the, this gospel is just a different sort, uh, or a different way to tell the story of Jesus. It is not, you know, a, a telling like what Mark basically gives you, which is kind of A to Z, you know, and starting, you know, Mark starts in uh, the, with John the Baptist in, at the Jordan River. It kind of goes from there, and Matthew and, and Luke get there eventually, but they have some prologues about the, the nativity narratives, right? But eventually they start their story. Their story really starts in, in earnest at the same spot ends at the same spot. Um, Luke will have a volume two, which we'll get to after John, right? So called Acts of the Apostles. Um, but John, in a sense, the, the way to, uh, to encounter John's gospel is if you go into it thinking you're going to get that same sort of narrative from point A, an orderly progression from point A to point C, you'll be very sorely disappointed or confused. You know, because John's gospel doesn't work that way. John's gospel is not told as a narrative that works in the same kind of, dunk, 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 you know. So where, so where Luke starts out his gospel by saying, I am, I am setting out to write an orderly account. That's, not, what, that's John, not John's mission. John's mission is not to write an orderly account of Jesus' ministry in the flesh. I want you to think, instead of like a straight road, you should think of John's gospel as an ascending staircase. That it has the gospel goes through his story, in a sense, he, it, it basically, he start and he, you're going, and you're going deeper into a, a mystery. A mystery of Christ's victory over death in powerless love and suffering love, that's the mystery, that, that something like that could happen, and did happen. And, um, and that, that, that mystery occurs, um, and, and basically he's gonna, he's gonna come up to it and, and he'll have themes. It's really a, a, a theme-based reporting. So it's in the same, like if you wrote a paper in school, you would, you would have like a history paper, right? If you organize your history presentation and like from 1776 to 1865, Revolutionary War is a war. And, so, you know, and you were to tell that story, right, sequentially, you, have, you can have a sequential presentation of data or a thematic presentation of data, right? You know, we're, so we're gonna, so we, we you know, we, we, when you're in history class, maybe, I don't know, but my, my history teacher did this. You know, you, you had to be able to tell both, right? You would tell it one way, but then you'd have to be able to tell Okay, here are the stepping stones to the Civil War economics, politics, right? The constitutional legal stuff, uh, society, religion, and you know, trace each of these things has a thread through those years all by themselves. Or something where you take the cross section of what is most important in each of those things sequentially through. John is thematic. So he's gonna give you what John is going to do, he's going to give you thematic encounters. 
So another like, and which is for those of you who went to the visioning retreat, the outreach visioning retreat, I, I dwelt heavily in John. John's gospel is the gospel of divine encounter, of a person to person encounter with God in the flesh. That's, that's what he's, that's, so John has much less emphasis on the crowds He's going to go for the passages, and the passages that you're familiar with that we read in the Sunday lectionary are those encounters. Basically, we kind of cherry pick those encounters. But if you think about it, basically, you have um, you know the wedding in Cana of Galilee, chapter two. That's really an encounter between Jesus and his mother. It's, it's like you know they have this encounter, and then and then new creation explodes from the. And that's what the, these encounters are. It's not just like, hey, nice to meet you. You know, I'm Jesus. Good luck with that. You know, that's not, that's, you know I'm running for Messiah. Hope I got your support. Thank you. You know, it's not, that's not what these encounters are about, right? It's, it's an encounter has a, a time of, of kairos, a, a crisis time, a, a time where that mystery that we're waiting for at the end of the story, that mystery breaks out into new creation. The water into the wine, for example. That's new creation, power bursting out of that encounter between Jesus and his mother, the, his mother and the servants. Do whatever he tells you, right? And then, and then, and 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 that those are called in John's gospel. Those are called signs, right? And that there are seven signs in this. So. He organizes his, you know, so again, if you look at Matthew, uh, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, they, you can almost, they, they organize themselves in like blocks of material, right? Matthew is typically teaching, like Sermon on the Mount, three chapters, boom, you know, so you have like what he did, and then he talked a lot, and then more, and then, and then he went to this place where he did some stuff, and then he talked a lot, and then, you know, that, that's how they, John organizes it in terms of signs, which again are encounters. And how you respond to the signs of the new creation is a big deal for John. It's a, a, lot of, a lot of what he's going on about is do you respond to the signs with faith? Do you ex express in belief? Do you believe in the Son of God or not? Or do you reject the sign? Do you doubt the sign? Do you miss the sign because you are thinking of it in a materialistic way, like the bread, right? The multiplication of the bread. And they, Jesus says, it's not about bread. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, no, it wasn't just about the bread. You're missing the sign, you know? And uh, so that's, it's, um, and, you know, the storm, even though, you know, the, 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 all four gospels have the feeding of the 5,000, right? And for John, it's a sign. And then, and all four gospels is that you have the feeding of the 5,000 followed by the storm. And Jesus, and there's some sort of, basically something happens in a boat with the storm. In various, you know, there are details that change. But <laughs> basically then, the disciples are on a boat, Jesus gets to them. Right? And for, for John, it's not about, so in the other synoptic gospels, this is, who is this that even commands the winds to obey him? Right? It's about Jesus is the creator of heaven and earth. Well, John doesn't need to do that because he's told you Jesus is the creator in his prologue. He was in with God. Nothing was made without him. So he's already told you that. So he doesn't have to tell you that again in the story. So the storm is about more than a storm, right? It allows for us to read Jesus's coming into the boat in the midst of the storm has that encounter with the power of the divine in the storms of our life. It, John deliberately writes in that thematic, metaphoric, symbolic way is deliberate. It is not meant to be a newspaper account. I mean, none of the Gospels are, as I've been telling you, are meant to be that newspaper account, but John even less so, or even like the opposite. So like you have the wedding, you have the Samaritan woman, an entire chapter where the Synoptic Gospels have the encounter of the Syrophoenician woman, and it's like a paragraph. It's a good paragraph. I mean, we read it on a Sunday. I mean, we, you will, you, but John gives that a whole chapter. Why? Because that's par is paradigmatic. It's a sign. 
of what Jesus is up to. Nicodemus, right, has the quintessential encounter, right, with the one who is seeking for God but is missing the boat, right? It's like, oh, you know, how much, how much longer must I be with you? Right? How much I, you know, you're missing the boat. So, you know, the blind, you know, the healing of the man were blind, Lazarus, right? Each of the, so basically John takes in these encounters and makes a chapter out of what is a paragraph in the synoptics. And that's, his, that's the way he tells the story of Jesus. That's, so again, so that as we enter into John, it's a very different project. And you just, unless you appreciate about it, you'll, you'll miss the boat. You will be like some, what the characters in the story. And that's what John is deliberately doing is you are going to become like one of these characters in the story, the thing is just about the bread. It, it, you know, you think it's, the story is just about getting from Jesus from place to place until he finally winds up in Jerusalem, but that's not what it's about. So John will deliberately, as well, John will deliberately have confusing geography. Like, uh, that anybody who, like, knows the place would be like, how would you get from that side? Like, the, that doesn't work. You know, and... and Right, it's a mystery. Right, it's you know don't don't overthink this. That's you know don't get caught up. Whereas you know Mark and Matthew especially, they are kind of plotting his journey from Galilee to Jerusalem with the names of the villages. And Luke just says, well, I'm not sure where it was. It was in a certain village, right? You know, but John's like, you know, you know where what village was? You know, is it is it here? Is he there? And now all of a sudden he's here, and, and that's the that's the name. You know, that, that God kind of shows up, signs of people. <coughs> You don't, you can't, and, and so in a sense, Jesus is like this, the wind of the spirit that he describes in that passage we read on a Sunday with Nicodemus. You know, the, the Holy Spirit's like a wind. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going. And Jesus is that, right? That's, see, that's the way John writes. Jesus is that wind. He is, because one of the things is like, where does he come from? We don't know, where does he come from? Is he, is he from Bethlehem? Is he from Jerusalem? Or maybe he's a mystery. We don't know. Where, what are his origins? The origins of Jesus for John. It's kind of like John wants to ask you, where do you think he's from? <laughs> you know, he doesn't give us a nativity. He doesn't anchor. Now, it's clear, as we'll kind of go through, it's clear that John does know about Bethlehem. It's not like he doesn't know about Bethlehem or Nazareth, right? That Jesus was in those places and somehow rooted in them. But for John, that's not the point. Jesus' true nativity was at the bosom of the Father before everything was made. That's where he's from. Right? So if you're talking about Jesus from the, that perspective, it's going to look a lot different. You know, it's, it's, so, it, so this is just a, I really want to kind of set the stage for what John is up to. Because we don't get to do that, really, and because we don't go systematically through John in the same way that we do Mark, Matthew, and Luke in the liturgical year. Again, you just we cherry pick the highlights, and uh, without really getting through the way that John, right, you know, presents his story. So, when was John committed to writing? Again, I always say, when was it committed to writing, as opposed to when was it written? Um, you know, so it doesn't have like a copyright date, you know, Library of Congress, you know, we don't have that, right? Um, nor would we want it. Uh, so we think that this is, is pretty late in the sense that, so that this, the traditions of John have been committed to writing somewhere in the late 80s, early 90s, so call it 90, just to, you know, have a year, but somewhere in that time period. In the tradition, John, and it's, it seems fairly strong, that John is the only disciple who is, is the, the tradition is that he's the only, or the only of the original 12 who's not martyred, and that he lives to an old age in Ephesus, he, where he has Jesus' his mother there with him in Ephesus, and so if you go to Ephesus, there'll be a traditional site of, of John's home with Mary, um, and, but that he, he lives in Ephesus, and is a very, you know, and kind of becomes a venerable man. We know that there is a real flesh and blood from historical documents that there was a bishop named Irenaeus who wrote in about AD 150 
who wrote a, a work called Against the Heretics, or Against Heresies, and it basically uh, against the Gnostic heretics. And so he, part of his shtick is, hey, listen, I, there's a, there, you have the scriptures, and then you also have an oral testimony to Jesus that, that was transmitted by the, through the bishops. Of, with, and he basically is the first one to present the apostolic succession. He doesn't call it that. But again, for him, it's relational. It's not institutional. Basically, he says, Irenaeus, he refers to himself in the third person, Irenaeus sat at the feet of Polycarp. We know there was a Polycarp, because we have his letters, too, and an account of his martyrdom. Who sat at the feet of John? Who sat at the feet of Jesus? So in 150, we have somebody who like, is, is basically you know, three degrees of separation away from the Lord himself and says, basically, I learned from Polycarp. When Polycarp was an old man, I was a young man. I learned from him. When Polycarp was a young man, he learned from John when he was an old man. And then back to Jesus. And that takes you back 120 years, basically. So in the living memory of the apostolic church, you have this transmission that John lived long enough to transmit a tradition. So was John alive at the time of the writing? We don't know. But that this is his testimony, I think we can be assured. The and there is some in, there's some which we'll cover is like the idea of, of testimony. Is like this is the one who's like I'll just read it. This is in the this is in the Passion of John. And it's often just kind of you, you'll never we'll never preach this because this you know you, this is a, a, a verse you preach on Good Friday. This is when we read. That's when you read John's Passion. It says in chapter 19. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Then in verse 35, it's a parenthetical comment. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. Right? So there's this kind of idea that the, the, the testifier to the passion is being testified to by a third party. But the one who saw this was telling the truth. And we know, we, we trust his testimony because he was their, he was their bishop, their pastor, their teacher. So another, just one more endearing thing about a, a tradition about John is that um, towards the end of his life, again, evidently he lived into his, uh, I think they, they usually traditionally they like round numbers, so they, they lived to 80, which back then <laughs> was like, you know, unheard of. Um, I mean, you think like when I went to Sudan, there were very few men, or women for that matter, with gray hair. I mean, it's, you know, it's it. And, and if you live long enough, if you're one of the few who lived that long, I mean, you were an elder, I mean, because you just made it, right? I mean, you have some experience. And so to be 80 in that time period would have been, you know, you were, it was considered like a miracle. I mean, anybody who lived to the 70 or 80 was that, you've been blessed. And they consider that a blessing. In our culture, right, it's the opposite, like, you know, old age. For, for, you know, right? Because in our culture, it's all about if you're able to produce, if you're beautiful, if you're fast, if you're, you know, powerful. That's our culture. So our culture values youth over age. That's, right? It was just the opposite in their culture. That in a sense, if you made it through your 30s, your authority in the community goes like this. Right? So, um, so John is this venerable figure and evidently there well there's a tradition that in his in towards the end of his life they would say you know father to john to you know potter please give us a word in the sermon they would have him preach and so that he would he would just kind of the, the, and his sermons were he would simply say um every week they do this he would say little children love one another and that was his sermon that, that in the last years of his life, that's what he would do. That it was his, his, one, his one line sermon. And, and you, you get that because that's, that in a sense, John's tradition brings out the love of God in a way that the synoptics do not. Not that the synoptics don't have the love of God in them, mm -hmm. but as I've preached in one of my sermons here, um, you know, if you were to try to prove the, the theorem, God is love without using any of John's gospel or letters, 
It's not impossible. <laughs> there are resources for doing that, like Corinthians 13 and blah, 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 but it's a lot harder, right? <laughs> but, but John foregrounds the unconditional love of God as a key part of God's encounter with humanity in Jesus. That's what Jesus came to teach us, is that, and that this, the, this encounter is one of intimacy, um, signified by the image of the bosom of God. That in a sense, in John's, John's prologue, chapter 1, verse 18 ends, No one has ever seen God. It is God the only Son, who is, is in the NRSV, it says, close to the Father's heart. Okay, heart is cardia. Right, it's where you get cardiac medicine. Heart is cardia. That's not the Greek word that's there. The Greek word is kolpos, which is breast. It's the it's the it's the bosom. It's the and it's not necessarily it's not a female breast. It's just the the, the bosom. And so it's the father's bosom, right? Not just like not heart is in this. And we obviously he's close to the father's heart is in some sort of subjective like like God literally liked him. You know, he's like, heart. You know, that's not what it is. It's he's being he is he is the one who was held like the image here is of a small child held to the bosom of a parent. Right? And that's that's the word. The son is the one who knows God that way, who hears God's heartbeat in a sense, his love, fleshy wise, right? And so then and then what happens in with John, right, in, in the at the Last Supper, John is Peter said to the one who was reclining against the master's bosom, right? and that Jesus like was holding, and so we think that so that that John the beloved is kind of the kind of like the young brother, the kind of the young kid, but probably a fourteen year old or so, who's in that group, kind of like kind of like the kid in the group of twelve, right? and that. That Jesus had a special care for him as the youngest, right? And, and kind of, and so that, anyway, that's how John experienced himself. He experienced himself as the beloved one, the one that he loved, right? you know, because he held me at the last night that he shared. So for John, that's a clearly powerful image that he had from Jesus, and then he says that's how Jesus was with the Father before the creation of everything. Was, he was held that way. So that's the nature of this gospel that we have. Also, that in John's gospel, what we'll encounter thematically is that it, it almost, it's almost like the, the greater the relief, it's almost the, the relief is, is greater, the contrast is greater, that with this love and this beautiful, wondrous experience of intimacy with God, of all the gospels, it is also the most conflictual that the, the, the Pharisees and the, and the temple authority, the, who are called the, in the NRSV, it uses the word Jews, but in the Greek it's the Hudioi or the Judeans. And if I could do, if I were like king for a day or, you know, Archbishop of Canterbury for a day, <laughs> I, would, I would say that, that, from, that the, the Jews, you, it would be eliminated from the Bible translations and it would simply say the Judeans. And we would use that longer word because oh, the Judeans, the way that this word is used, the Jews, it, all the people in the story are Jews. Jesus is a Jew. The disciples are Jews. The temple people are Jews. The Jerusalemites are Jews. Everybody's a Jew. So what are these Jews? The Judeans are a political party. You have to think of them as like a, a sectarian political interest group. The Judeans who live in Jerusalem and run the temple as opposed to the rest of us Jews, right? It's almost, it's a distinctive appellation, not an ethnic description. Because it wouldn't make sense because it would apply to all of them in the, in the narrative. So it's the Judeans, but the conflict with, so it's not a conflict, and this is really important, especially in a, a, a post-Holocaust world, where we have to be absolutely clear, in the same way that when I unpacked Matthew's in the Passion Arab, where the crowds in Jerusalem says, 
may his blood be upon us and upon our children is different when a Jew says that. And Matthew was one, right? So it's different for Matthew the Jew to, to report that than for Luke, who does not report it, right? Luke doesn't say the blood is on all the, the head of all the Jews. Matthew the Jew says that. It's different, right? So, um, so the, it's in the same way, John is so talking about the Jews, is we have to understand that this is a political party that is in uh, deadly uh, opposition to Jesus. Right? From the beginning, they want to kill him. And they do. And right, you have to remember, they do actually kill him. Right? So this isn't a part. You know, we, we can't go into this narrative just because we know how it turns out. We can't go into this narrative like it's some sort of parlor game or debate society. That in Jesus is, when Jesus is arguing, if you want to call it that, with the temple authorities on their turf in the temple, is, this is a life and death game. You don't do this. It's like, it's like basically, it's like, it's like running against a dictator in, uh, in, a, in one of those elections. It's like being the opposition candidate in a Latin American dictatorship, right? You don't do that lightly. This isn't just about a contest of ideas. This is, you are all in. If you're, you know, if you're gonna go head to head and actually make a run at it, you gotta be ready to be killed or disappear, right? You know, that, that's, that's how it works. And so when Jesus is there, that's what he's doing. This is something where he is coming in. He doesn't have an army. He re specifically refuses, as we, in John chapter six, we see they try to take him by force to make him king, right? And he withdraws from them. And I tweeted about that. If you, so you follow my tweets, when well, I know it's going, yeah, I, just, I love you, brother. I guess, so, like, <laughs> you, you, you follow me. So, um, so that 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 um, they try to make him king by through violence and basically be a king that is violent, basically a, a political revolt. He deliberately rejects <laughs> that, withdraws from them. So he doesn't come there with an army behind him. He, so he is completely powerless in the situation. So when we have to, when we hear that, we have to put ourselves in that situation. This is not, you know, we we're not, we don't, we hear this as citizens of a superpower, right? And so our notion of these sorts of things is skewed, right? This is so we have to hear that when he's going hammer and tongs, this is about with these folks. This is a game of life and death, and he dies. So. I just put that out there to help, you know, condition and help us understand um, and, in a sense, be more sympathetic with the controversies. It's a controversy belt. Okay, so now we're going to actually get into, um, and so this conflictual nature of Jesus' mission is the first passage, in a sense, is the first one we get to, where you do get, on the, in the Sunday lectionary, and I also include Christmas Eve, the, like the Christmas, pro, you know, reading on the prologue. In, as something that you've heard, might have heard. Um, so the, the good news is that you actually hear uh, almost the entirety of J John chapters one and two in, in the church services. So that's read and it's known as like, you know, it's like the, all those great stories with um, Nathaniel and the ladder going up and down and, and, you know, Peter getting James John, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, all those wonderful little things. Uh, Cana and Galilee, uh, you know, the cleansing of the temple, which we read the Johannine version of the cleansing of the temple. We don't read the synoptic versions of that. Um, again, John moves the cleansing of the temple to the front of his narrative. Clearly, if you look at it historically, the cleansing of the temple was the last straw. I mean, clearly that was the last real kind of political act that, that Jesus says the Messiah accomplished. And they're like, okay, that's it. We're, you know, we're going to go get him. And then they do. In John's, in John's narrative, again, he doesn't, he moves it to the front because he wants you to know what Jesus says. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. It's a signal. It's like that staircase. It's like it's one of the first, so he uses one of the first few steps on the, the staircase, right? So it's by the, there's a resurrection coming, you know. Also, there's a destruction of this body coming. Destroy this body. And I'll read it. So you already have in chapter two a foreshadowing of the crucifixion and resurrection. That's what I'm talking about. This is the way John thematically builds 
And it's just hinted at. It's just kind of like a little hint. But, it's, but for those who have eyes to see, right, it's coming. So he wants to put, he puts that way in the front of his narrative. And then after that, we have John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. So it's just a little interstitial passage, you know, just something kind of, but it says, um, and then when I have longer ones, I, I do have handouts, so, uh, so you can have it. But it says, when Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. Ah, so there's that theme earmarked for you. So if you have your Bible out or if you don't have it, circle signs. <laughs> like, that's like, um, but Jesus on his part would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone. For he himself knew what was in everyone. Da, da, da. So, anyway, so he's going to know what's inside Judas. He's going to know what's inside Peter. He, so already John wants you to know Jesus is fully aware. And basically nothing in what's about to happen is going to catch this guy by surprise or off guard. He's God. <laughs> you know, so in a sense, John did not need the Nicene Creed. To be Trinitarian, <laughs> you know, because you got you got Spirit, you got Holy Spirit in here, you got Jesus as God. I mean, you, you, so this is not something that gets like you know some sort of Dan Brown novel where this is all something invented in the fourth century, <laughs> right? This is you know AD ninety. It's like here, okay. So I'm just I got to put that out there. You know, um, I, it's like my mission is to deprogram you from all that stuff, <laughs> everything you watched on the History Channel um, <laughs> and the Discovery Channel. Those are like the it's like. <laughs> Anyway, so, so he's in Jerusalem during the Passover festival. So John's gospel, by the way, is organized in, basically has three years. There's kind of a year one, year two, year three, and the Passover festival is the way that John kind of marks his timeline. So this is the first Passover in chapter 7, 8, we're going to get another, or in chapter 6, I'm sorry, in chapter 6, we're going to get another Passover. And, the, and so John ties the feeding of the 5,000 to that Passover. So Jesus is celebrating the Passover, again, to underline, he's the new temple, right? You don't have to go to Jerusalem. Go to Jesus to do the Passover because he will get you Passover from death to life. I mean, so, anyway, so that, that's the whole point of associating the feeding of the 5,000 with the synoptics do not do. Because the synoptics, they're telling you a story, and so they have their story basically begin and end in one year. It's kind of like springtime in Galilee to the next Passover, the end. <laughs> John lets you know that actually this unfolded over three years, which is actually, in my judgment, more realistic in the sense that this kind of builds. This is a movement that builds. Um, this wasn't all. This wasn't like a, a flash mob in Jerusalem on one Passover. And all of a sudden, you know, it's like this is this is something where he's building a movement. So you have John six, and then the final Passover, and at significant moments in his narrative, John says at the Passover festival, just to let you know, okay, a year has passed. Why would you need that? Because you wouldn't know. Because he, again, he takes these divine encounters, these one-on-one -on -one encounters. He just has to let you know that time has elapsed. This isn't happening in like a three-week period. You might get that impression because he's just like, okay, Nicodemus, Samaritan woman, you know, like you, you know, you could, I could see you doing that in about a month. Um, he has to tell you that you know, life is being lived along the way. Time is elapsing, but I'm not. We're not going to talk about those things because it's these things that you need to hear about. So when he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed. Key theme: Do you believe? Um, in his name, but there's a problem because of the signs that he was doing. And so one of the, the, the subtle things that, that John's gospel does is it, that Jesus does a sign. So in, at, at the end of the Cana miracle, um, it says, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory and his subs believed him. They saw the signs that he was doing, and in chapter 3, verse 2, Nicodemus is going to come up to him, right? I mean, so right after this passage, and say, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. So Nicodemus comes right on the heels of this particular, these verses, basically saying, many believe because of the signs. Let me introduce you to one who believed because of the signs, Nicodemus. 
enter Nicodemus, right? And then, and so this is about, so what are you looking for in these signs? You know, and then Jesus will say, well, you have to be born from above, right? Or, you know, incorrectly translated, born again. But you have to be the, the, the real, you know, I go with the, the Greek is you have to be born from above, basically where I come from. You have to come from my country to, and basically what Jesus is doing is giving people a new birth certificate. Mm. That's his mission, right? Is in believing in him, you get issued a new birth certificate. And instead of being born in Bethlehem, Nazareth, or La Jolla, California, you're born in the bosom of the Father. Mm. That's your new origin in Jesus. That's what he's doing. So the signs, so the signs are point, you know, signs are things that point to something else. And so they're not miracles where the concentration is on the thing itself, the, that just happened. That's our, that's our modern kind of, ooh, the miracle, like how neat, how neat for people to eat. All those people, all that, what a miracle. And we focus on the bread part versus understanding this it's a sign pointing towards something else. And that's what Jesus is gonna be struggling to do, that John reframes Jesus's wonders in the, to use the a Lucan phrase, signs and wonders, um, that John reframes these as things that point towards Jesus' true origin and ours, and Jesus' destiny and ours. Right? He's going back to the bosom of the Father. At, when, G when Mary Magdalene clings to his feet, or tries to, and it's kind of like, he's like, don't, you can't touch me, don't, don't grab hold of me, because I'm going back to the Father. And then, he, and before that, he tells his disciples, "I'm preparing a place for you with my Father. There are plenty of rooms there. Don't you worry about it, right? There's plenty of room in the bosom of the Father for all of us, right? So, origin and destiny—that's what we receive in Jesus. And John wants to bring that out. So, don't let the signs fool you, or take them in a, in a direction that isn't your true destiny." You need to follow the signs to where Jesus is going in suffering love back to the bosom of the Father through the cross, right? Um, so Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them. So, uh, so he, um, so belief can also the word Greek word pistis can also mean trust. So many are trusting in Jesus, but Jesus not trusts right? because he knows what's in their hearts. He knows that they are basically wanting to manipulate his messiahship for, you know, for other purposes than what he's got. They have to be born from above, not like Nic Nic Nicodemus is gonna come and misinterpret the kingdom movement. And so Jesus doesn't, he's basically, I'm not going to, I'm not gonna put myself in your hands. You have to put yourself in my hands. That's how this works. That's, you know, he does, Jesus does not entrust himself to us. He asks us to entrust ourselves to him. That's the direction of the trust, of the belief, the pistis. We have to give it to him. And, uh, and then for he himself knows what was in everyone, but he himself, in the, in the Greek, of course, it's, it's uh, he knew what was in an anthropos, he knew what was in a man. Which, you know, again, it's like Shakespeare, take it with great salt, you know, we're, we're not gonna dumb down Shakespeare, it'll be in our speed, does. Um, but, uh, but, the idea here is that in then in walks Nicodemus. He knows what's in you know, he knows what's in a man, and then a man named Nicodemus comes, and he points right to Nicodemus's understanding, because <laughs> Jesus knows, right? He and so he can push right where Nicodemus um, doesn't want to go. So you have the but also and fi this is my final point that he's in Jerusalem at the Passover, and so. Those two things together, Jerusalem and Passover, are going to be, in a sense, the markers in the whole narrative that Jerusalem is going to be the place of disbelief. It's, you know, and where the Synoptic Gospels, Jerusalem is the place that everything's headed, right? That's going to be the, you know, it's all going to the OK Corral, you know, at the end of the movie. You know, everybody's going to go there and there's going to be a shootout. And movie, the end. Um, and... But for John, again, he bounces us back and forth. And so Jerusalem becomes the symbol of disbelief, 
of distrust. Galilee becomes the symbol of faith. It's interesting. Mm. Galilee is the symbol of faith in this narrative. Different from the other narratives, different from the other Gospels. But for John, that, so when you think Jerusalem, Passover is lack of, lack of faith, lack of trust, Galilee, openness. You know, and basically anywhere outside of Jerusalem is a good place. So John is beginning to set up this dynamic already. It's going to get more and more intense, again, as that spiral staircase keeps going. But already we get the hints that Jerusalem is not a friendly place for Jesus. And Jerusalem is not a place conducive to faith. Okay, so we'll come back for a, a big passage in John chapter 3, and I'll have handouts next time. So, all right, see, see you next week.